Talyn Wadsworth is uh, the lead product, product designer for Project Comet, Adobe's new design tool for UX and uh, UI and mobile uh, app design. As part of XD, Adobe's inter uh, internal design team, Talyn has led many 1.0 product initiatives, including the launch of Creative Cloud and Adobe Sketch for the iPad. He is obsessed with design, risograph printing, and the monthly trading card series he produces for his team. Uh, Andrew uh, is a British digital designer uh, who relocated to New York City in November 2014 to work on Adobe Portfolio, a website creator editor product by the team at Behance. He specifically works on all product UI and UX designs, ideas, concepts, creative direction, marketing, and branding. Uh, until this past year, he was a freelance digital designer and developer, uh, working int internationally remotely from England and Spain for clients including Nike, MTV, Facebook, and Red Bull. Also, until late last year, he was a product designer part-time at London um, in a London-based startup uh, in the charity sector called Believe.in. So how this is going to work today, uh, ta uh, Andrew's going to talk for about five to ten minutes on uh, what he's working on. Uh, Talon's going to talk about ten minutes, and then uh, we're just going to have kind of a moderated discussion for like 20 minutes before opening up for questions. Uh, so without further ado, Andrew. Okay. Um, okay. Um, hi. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I am a do um, I'm a product designer on a product called Adobe Portfolio, and I work out of the Behance office here in New York City. Uh, today, I'm going to share with you what we've been working on this past year. Um, so we're going to look at um, what what is Adobe Portfolio. Uh, we're going to look at the product itself, and then we're going to talk about the design process. I'm going to show you some sketches, some specs, and some design work that's gone on behind the scenes. So hopefully that'll be interesting. So what is Adobe Portfolio? Basically, it's, um, it's a product that allows you to quickly and simply create um, a website to showcase your work and customize it to suit your style and needs. It's definitely not a new concept. There are dozens of products on the market that do just that. But Portfolio is different for a few key reasons. Uh, this is the marketing site. You can see this now at myportfolio.com. Um, it's designed specifically for creatives to showcase their portfolio, meaning it does what you need it to do simply and quickly. It's, um, it's free um, with all creative cloud plans. Uh, you can access all of Typekit's um, fonts uh, to use on your website, and you can easily add photos from Lightroom to your website, which is great, especially for photographers. Um, but the thing that makes it most unique is that it syncs with Behance. Um, I'm hoping people have at least heard of Behance, so I don't have to explain that. Um, the idea being that you can create a beautiful custom portfolio site and sync it to your Behance profile, uh, where you can gain invaluable exposure for your work on a creative platform used by millions of creatives um, uh, and also people recruiting creatives, importantly. But you don't have to use portfolio. Uh, <laughs> we hope you use portfolio. You don't have to use Behance if you don't want to. You can, you can use Portfolio on its own without syncing with Behance. The choice is yours. So like any website builder, you need a starting point. So one of the many things we needed to design were layouts geared specifically for showcasing creative work. Um, we're launching with five layouts. I'm actually going to show you six here. There'll be one following short out, shortly after. Um, they're all responsive. Uh, and they aim to cover a variety of styles to suit different tastes and creative fields, just like Behance does. So I'm just going to click through. So, and now onto the editor, how do we build these things? The product must enable the user to quickly and simply edit their website. The editor needs to be simple, clean, and beautiful. It should empower the user to easily edit anything they can see, manage content, responsibly preview their website, and publish and update a live website. Um, I've, I'm just going to go through a few slides now, which will basically show some of the screens from the editor to, to show some of the core ways that you can edit content. So here we're going to see uh, resizing and cropping of images, um, direct access, anything on the page so you can edit, uh, managing content, adding content, uh, re uh, responsibly previewing, this time in tablet portrait and mobile portrait. Um, switching to a different layout at any time, which is, which is very useful. 
um, and uh, finding a Typekit font to use. You can, you can browse all the Typekit fonts and you can very quickly change out the fonts to see which works best for you. And of course, adding and editing pages. So how did this all come together? Um, my role as a, as a product designer on portfolios changed very dramatically over the past year. Uh, as a digital product progresses, so too does your role as a product designer. So to go back to the start, Portfolio is actually the evolution of an existing Behance product called ProSite. This is just the marketing site. Um, so there's a lot we can learn from that product. It's five years old. That's a lot of information. What worked well, what didn't. Um, also, what we know of the creative community through designing and growing the Behance network over the years and uh, is, is invaluable in understanding how to build a product like Portfolio. So understanding your audience is a great starting point. So I personally spent a great deal of time uh, absorbing all this knowledge um, by talking to people at Behance, asking questions, making notes. And um, just to say, I always start with a pencil and sketchbook. That's my personal preference. Maybe I'm old fashioned, but writing and sketching really helps me to focus and ideas flow from there. So I've, pardon the crude scans, but um, this is just a quick scan of my sketchbook. Um, sometimes I simply write words uh, I associate with the product. I hope there's nothing bad written here. <laughs> um, or at least what it needs to do just to get it out of my head. It, it really does help. Um, it helps to unclutter the mind and focus on what's important. The sketchbook work naturally evolves into UI sketches. Sometimes I'll sketch a feature or a small UI detail or map out user flows or sketch a new approach entirely to the, uh, to the UI. I'm not sure what these are. <laughs> um, it's a quick way of purely and simply exploring ideas. So I, I particularly like this one I found because you can actually see the sketch actually married up very closely to the final design, which was kind of interesting. Um, but there's always a point when you know you have enough to start actually getting down and designing the product. So in the past, I've used Illustrator for this to wireframe, but I started this job a year ago. There was a lot of work that went on before I started, but that's not a lot of time to start designing and get a big, an army of developers building what you're doing. So time was incredibly tight, so I went straight into Photoshop on this one. And um, honestly, I'm sure Talon will appreciate that Project Comet would have been incredibly useful to me this past year. <laughs> Maybe next year, we'll see. <laughs> um, so all of, these, all of these ideas, all of these sketches you've seen and things I'm going to show um, inform and evolve over time through concepting with the team at Behance. Um, it's always good to chat through ideas with other designers and developers. A fresh perspective always helps. Um, Designing specs and taking the guesswork out of it for the developers. Simply put, your team needs to understand what needs to be built. Um, so I'm going to show you some specs and some designs now. So um, I like to create detailed specs of all the UI components and features. You'll probably notice I'm kind of OCD with this stuff. But, <laughs> um, but I feel these things are very important when you have a large team of developers for communicating your ideas. Uh, the specs aim to cover all scenarios from rollover states to errors, active states, inactive states. This is how editing text looks. Um, how do we message the users? Um, these specs might seem like a lot, but the more detail you include in your designs, the less questions the developers will have and the less time you will spend managing the build. So you can focus on designing and testing. So I'm just going to show couple more here. Also, the nice thing about taking the time to create these UI kits is that it's really easy to update the designs in the future. So I don't need to update 100 mockups and wireframes. I can simply update these style guides and specs. And of course, responsive design is very important. It's not, it's not the developer's job to figure this out. Uh, you'll, be the you'll be the developer's best friend if you take the guesswork out of them, believe me. <laughs> um, and finally, user testing. This is really important in product design. Uh, you learn so much from using the product. Um, the best way to know if it works is to use it. You'll be amazed by what you discover. <laughs> 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 uh, 
I have no credit for this, sorry. Um, <laughs> but the point being, people don't always use the product the way you expected them to do. <laughs> but that's good, that's a good thing. You learn, you improve, you iterate on the product, you keep testing, and you repeat that process. And honestly, sometimes it does feel a little like this. The past few months of my life have been a little bit like this. <laughs> but the product will be better for it. So in conclusion, um, if I was to take anything away from this, it would be to slow down, get inspired, understand your audience, make notes and sketch ideas. Concept, work with your team, explore ideas, think it through. Detail and design, someone else needs to design what you're designing. <laughs> someone else needs to build what you're designing. <laughs> Test, does it work? How can it be improved? It can always be improved. And learn, always. Every experience design is a good learning experience. So, that's me. Great, all right. Um, all right, hi guys. Um, let's see, tonight. We're gonna talk a little bit about kind of what we do at Adobe. Um, there's definitely gonna be some overlap with Andrew and I, but I think that's okay. Uh, repetition is how we learn, right? That's how we do it. Um, right, so this is me. Um, I'm a lead product designer for Project Comet, which was we just announced here this year at, at Max. Um, we'll get back to that. Um, so this is Adobe, and this is who I work for. Um, I work as part of XD, um, which is the central design uh, organization within Adobe. Uh, we work on all the major products, uh, for, particularly for Creative Cloud, but also for the Marketing Cloud and for Acrobat as well. So it actually kind of uniquely positions us to, to kind of look across the company. There's not many organizations within Adobe that actually are set up this way, which uh, is both a, a, you know, a, maybe a blessing and a curse for us. Um, because you know, as designers, we always kind of have our eye on that bigger picture, um, but sometimes it doesn't always break down that way for us. Um, and so who are we in XD? Um, we're a group of designers, inventors, and developers. Um, and why are we working in Adobe? Well, it's kind of geeky, but you know, we get to imagine the tools of the future. Uh, we get to think about the tools that we need to do our jobs as designers. And sometimes we get to make that real, which is kind of a crazy opportunity. I mean, we have such sort of emotional connections, all of us, to the tools that we use every day. You know, we're craftsmen as well as designers, and we need these tools to help us do our jobs. Um, and it's pretty awesome to be able to do that, to design those tools. Um, and, and this is very similar to what I think something Andrew just shared as well. Uh, and this is our process. I and mean, I think as designers, we all do this. And this, these are the, this is not just the full process. This is the tiny little loops that we're always doing. Uh, you know, we're always, you know, trying something, looking at it, <laughs> just seeing it, and testing it in our own minds, and learning from that and moving on and iterating as fast as we can. And, and really, like, speed becomes our most important sort of um, tool, really. The more ideas we can see, the more ideas we can test, the more ideas, that's the more we can learn and come to a better solution. Um, but of course, you know, our challenge right now is, just seems to be growing. Um, you know, design, <laughs> I don't wanna say it was a simpler game, there were much more sort of different components at play, but we're living in a time when the things we're designing for, the places we're designing for are changing so rapidly and the possibilities are pretty much endless and we're designing for things we don't even know what they look like yet, um, which puts a lot on us, I think. And particularly because design's role, is just becoming a, a more integral part of any business, um, which again, just adds to the demands. Um, of course, you know, visual design. Uh, we already know all the things that we have to do here, and I think Andrew's, uh, some of his comps that he showed us, which were probably a small slice of all the things that we have to do as designers. Um, you know, that's, that's, our, that's our main job, really. We gotta make things look good. Um, but of course, now we have to think about how it moves and how it feels uh, and how, how it transitions and the choreography of pieces kind of, kind of within screen and then across screens. Um, and we got to design for the real world. If people can't use it, they're going to drop it. And you know, if people can't interact with it or can't experience it, then we're not doing our jobs. And so that's a whole new component that, that we have to account for. Uh, and of course, the biggest thing is that now that we have all these things we have to design for, the design has to be cohesive and tell a story across 
pretty much anywhere it gets applied. Uh, and again, these are just all these, these demands that we have. And, uh, and of course, um, you know, tonight what I'm gonna share with you is a little bit of how we do that at Adobe. I think Andrew showed some great things as well. And um, you know, we have all these problems and how do we solve it? Well, <laughs> for visual design, um, this is very similar to Andrew's comps as well. I could have just swapped them right in here. But this is actually an Illustrator file for the designer on Adobe Fix, uh, which is a new app that we launched this year. And he's pretty detailed. And this, I think, is exactly Andrew. I mean, everybody kind of knows this file. I mean, and they're really pushing the legacy tools to their limits, which is crazy. I mean, you know, we know the limits. We know what, how many things we can add before Illustrator starts chugging along or starts, or, you know, uh, Sketch or, or any of the tools start breaking. Like, we, we've met those limits, which is crazy to think about in the age of, like, modern software where it feels like we can do anything. We're still limited by the scope of these tools. Um, and then we're just pushing them to our limits. They're all, all the icons are all specced out of here and all the exporting is all done directly from this file. It's crazy. Um, yeah. And of course, the most important part of our job now in solving these problems is prototyping. Um, a prototype is worth a thousand meetings, basically. You know, if I can walk in and I can put the, give this to you in your hand and you can interact with it, we know it immediately whether it works or not. Uh, and so we're using all the tools, and I think there's, it feels like there's one, a new one every other month. Um, this is a Envision prototype from the amazing designer on uh, Adobe Capture, and he had a really unique challenge here. He was taking, I don't know if you guys had interacted with them, but he was taking three separate apps and a fourth one that was coming online, and he had to put them all in one app. And again, you know, as designers, not only are we solving design and interaction, but we're, again, we're think, we have to think about not only design, but business and technology as well. And so this was you know, how he was going to solve that problem of combining these apps together. Well, the only way he could do it, and I think come to as elegant a solution as he has, is by making a prototype. That's the only way he was going to solve this, to make it usable uh, for both the, the users that have been using the apps pre previously and all the new users that were going to come in and, and try it uh, when it launched. Um, it's one of my favorite apps. I, I love this app, and I thought he did a great job. Um, and of course, we're also... You know, not only thinking about the big picture, you know, but we want to be a little fancy. We want to show a little flair, you know, and so we want to think about how the little things move and blip and blop and do all the things on screen. And so, you know, we're using, you know, even more complex tooling to do uh, things like here. This was a this was a um, a prototype that we used for Project Comet actually to tell the basically the developers how we wanted and the software engineers, how we wanted the UI to interact in the panels, to do something new. And the only way we could do that is, is create uh, this prototype, which was uh, created in Framer.js. Um, again, a tool that it definitely skews to the more kind of pro end of the spectrum, um, but it allows us to really put our hands on, on it um, and really focus on this, this small interaction piece. And of course, this is the big one, and this, this, is a, you know, this is, again, this is about bridging that communication gap and delivering all these assets. But what's fascinating to me here, uh, and this is from Aryan Bazzotti, who is the designer on Capture as well, uh, is that he created this amazing, I and mean, this is above and beyond, amazing interactive style guide for handoff to a developer. Uh, and what I love about, this is created in InVision as well. And what I love about this, what it says to me is that um, this is, this is how tools affect our job. This is, how, this is when a designer has at their fingertips from the beginning of their workflow and they're already thinking about motion, and interaction, as well as visual design, like, I think the sky's the limit. Like, what are the results? Like, what's gonna happen? I can't, so I wanna see that day. And I think, again, like, I love this and I share it all the time be, just because, like, it's such a great solution to a problem that no customer's gonna see this. But this was about, again, communicating and closing that gap. And, uh, that really kind of brings me to, to Project Comet. Um, you know, we have these problems and we're trying to, to solve them using all kinds of tools. I mean, we, we, we're, we're connoisseurs. We're, we're out there just devouring every new thing to, to solve these complex problems that we have that are only going to get more and more complex as more of our, our life and our world end up kind of around us on screens and on uh, you know, cars and, and, and you know, watches and other devices. And so how are we going to solve those problems? And again, I really believe that tools affect outcomes. So what's that tool that we can use at Adobe to actually design the tools that we want to make for, for everyone else? And, and that really kind of led to Project Comet. And so um, 
I, uh, I'd show you guys the live demo, but I didn't know how much time we had. So I'm just going to share with you a couple, uh, couple of videos of actually the working build. This is actually, this is Project Comet. So brand new UI from, from Adobe. Um, and again, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do was bring um, uh, motion and interaction uh, together. But we wanted to take the opportunity when we're designing from scratch to rethink some of the details, or particularly focused on speed. And this is, a, this is showing off a feature uh, that we call the repeat grid for right now. What it allows you to do is that we looked at the ways in which we work and looked at the patterns in which we design, and we thought, how can we make that faster? And so we built a tool that basically can convert any object on the canvas and then repeat it infinitely. And then, but then the really great thing is that now that they're all there, and whenever I change something, it propagates down the list, well, now I can start rearranging and trying new ideas. And I'm not worried about, again, like, like editing each individual mask. I can take a whole group of images and just drag and drop them into, into the, my layout. I'm not worried about, again, like changing and, and handling. I said, like, before we'd copy and paste, copy and paste, and we'd be having to go through and, and edit you know, all of those individually. Uh, we'd have to make a style to make sure that if we, you know, and we had some idea came to us and we wanted to try something new, we have to go back and either plan ahead and make a style or change them all by hand. Um, and again, we thought, how can we make that better? And so now if I make a change to a style, that propagates, but if I change the content, that doesn't. Of course, the drag and drop is my favorite part. I could just kind of do that all day long. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it's all focused on speed, you know? I just need to be fast. And then I said, when designing a brand new app, we just we, we kind of have an opportunity to, to think about those details. And of course, the, the key thing here is, is marrying uh, you know, design, visual design, and, and interaction, and motion. And so here this is showing um, a video of just wiring up interaction. Like what happens when the same tool, I'm, they're, they're all together, and I can quickly just select an object and make it interactive and tell it where I want it to go and really define that kind of high level UX uh, sort of uh, flow of my document. And it's just so e easy. I mean, you know, this was a design I had from way, from really early on in the development process. And I wasn't sure it was gonna fly. It seemed kind of, I don't know, but it just ended up being so delightful. And I think, uh, again, when, when designing a brand new app, we're also, particularly one that's design focused, uh, we always want to have those things that, are, again, are not only fast, but also maybe just a little, little bit of fun in there. Um, I think it always kind of, I said, you, we didn't have, you didn't have to do it that way, but it just felt a little, a little better. And then, of course, we're also creating kind of a, a live connection. So whenever we're previewing it, again, I'm not stopping and starting. And, you know, we have those processes in our day that are kind of like death by a thousand cuts where we're always going back to this panel, back to this panel, back undo, undo, you know, and, and you know, we wanted to create this live connection. First, we're starting on the desktop, but we'll also have it on the device where whatever I change is immediately sort of seen uh, in the preview window or on my device. Um, and this is where it gets really crazy. <laughs> um, so you saw the drag and drop from a data source, which is a, a, a local sort of file folder uh, of files that I had. But we thought, well, we made this container now. What can we fill it with? Um, and so okay, we're gonna do the repeat grid here. But we thought, well, what if we could actually you know, pull from another data source, like a, like, a, like a text file? Actually, just drag and drop that right in as well. Um, again, really, like, instead of just me coming up with those names, like actually using real content. Those are the real names of my team members. Um, or using a built-in data set. Again, like getting closer to, to real. Like we, can, we always do that where you know, we're all you're writing our own he own headlines and curating our own images, you know. But what if, what if we were that much closer to designing for the real world? Because you know, the minute we hand off that beautifully designed comp with all the right names and all the right sort of things all dialed in, we send it over to a developer and it breaks it. So how can we again put in our workflows us that much closer to the to the real world and the real data? And so actually now we're actually going to go out to Behance here within Project Comet. And go ahead and just grab some uh, images from a real source. And there they are, right in my design. Um, again, and again, I think what, what this gets us when we're connected to the real world is that we actually, I think we design better. And we design for edge, we, we don't sort of just think of the edge cases as an afterthought. We're designing for the real people using the real services. 
and I think that just makes us better designers. You know, and it, does, it gets us away from, again, like making the perfect comp. Um, and we're really, I think we're also designing for people who maybe aren't well represented in design currently. And I think it just opens up a world of possibilities for us. Um, and of course, we also get to do something a little, little forward thinking. And this is just a thing I threw in here, which is actually showing some, some great work from a developer I work closely with in XD um, about that real connection to our device. And I had this dream when, what if I could have access to my design anywhere I am and actually be able to um, possibly make changes to it wherever I might be. And so not only are we looking at ways in which I can you know, do all this great stuff on the desktop, but actually select, actually change my design on my device, wherever I am. And what are the possibilities then? Um, so, thanks guys. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think we'll move into the, the moderator discussion part of uh, tonight. Um, and I've got a little list of questions here. <laughs> uh, so I think we'll start off general and um, uh, ask you, I heard like Framer.js and Illustrator as part of the, the processes uh, that you guys have. What other like favorite tools or um, uh, uh, good tools that you guys like to incorporate into your process? Well, uh, I, uh, I'll give myself away a little bit. I, uh, I love fireworks, and I miss it. It was a big part of our workflow at Adobe. Um, and since then, I think we've, we, we kind of looked at everything. Again, I'm, I'm probably a little different. I like to try kind of everything new out there. But right now, I use, I use Keynote a ton, um, mainly in, in my job as, as kind of lead product designer. Keynote was just such a fast way for me to bring in many different types of media and start to tell that story and start, start to tell that interactive story. And it's amazing kind of how far you can push Keynote um, with the simple mechanics that it, that it has. Again, it's not built for kind of you know motion and interactive prototyping, mm -hmm. but I end up using it a ton uh, for that. And as well as that, we use um, we use Envision a lot and uh, some of the new ones like Principle uh, and uh, again like Framer Frame JS and, mm -hmm. and the like. I don't like Quartz Composer though. Um, I guess my tool set is. Uh is a little smaller. Like I mean, like I say, I, I'm actually quite old-fashioned. I like to get stuff down the old-fashioned way on pencil and paper quite a lot. But um, for wireframing, uh, my tool of choice is Illustrator to get stuff down really fast. Um, in previous in previous places I've worked, I've, I used Omnigraffle a lot, which um, I was I wouldn't say was my favorite tool, but I found especially freelancing, you go into so many different agencies and companies that you tend to use what what they like. So um, yeah, some places we use Omnigraffle, some places we use Illustrator, other people swear by Photoshop. Um, it's different all the time. So for me, the bulk of, well, everything you saw, in fact, in, uh, in presentation was is done in Photoshop. Cool. So that's my uh, main tool of choice, I suppose. Yeah, you make a really good point, I think, about teams and about, um, you know, like your role as a designer when you come in is to adapt to the team, to be, to be fast. To, to, to right, minimize that communication barrier both between designers and between developers. And uh, I mean, that's how I ended up using Fireworks as I joined uh, XD and everybody used Fireworks. And I had never really used it before. But I ended up loving it. But again, like, I think, I think that, that, that happens a lot. And right now, the problem is that a lot of designers will go into uh, a new design team and they'll be picking up something new every month. Or they'll go to one and they're using this, and they'll go to another and they're using this, and it's a challenge, you know, right now. Uh, again, like I think they're even within XD, there are different teams that prefer different types of solutions. But the yeah. thing is that the demands on us don't change. Mm -hmm. Like we're all just trying to solve it in different ways. Gotcha. Yeah. Because that's one thing to keep in mind when you're doing freelance work is that you have to bounce around the, the tool yeah, sets. You have to adapt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and how do you keep up with the uh, latest um, design trends or innovations? I guess that's easy for me. Um, <laughs> in terms of um, keeping inspired, and uh, um, it's really Behance. You know, I. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, if you go and follow me on Behance, I uh, I have a lot of followers on Behance. I use it a lot. I've used it for about seven years now, and it's been very kind to my career. So, I'm a, yeah, a kind of a I guess a power user of that. Uh, I spend an abnormal amount of time on there. I also like to look at other sort of design inspiration sites like Awards and Site Inspire and. I've got various things that drop in my inbox every day. 
I, for, I forget half of their names. They just, yeah. They've just been coming to me forever. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just like to keep inspired. And I actually think medium.com is really great for that as well. I love to read articles on that. Yeah. 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 I think a lot of mine is, just comes from real hands-on experience. I think, um, you know, I'm constantly sort of inspired by the work of, of uh, you know, other interaction designers and app designers, uh, you know, just out there. Like you download, like I think Facebook just always just killing it. I feel like I'm always looking at whatever they're doing. Um, uh, you know, mainly just to get a sense of what's possible. I think that's what's really fascinating is as we grow with these devices that they're just some, some amazing designers who are just taking advantage of it. Uh, I think, you know, seeing, I'm just, you know, I need a need success now so I can see what's going on with 3D Touch and a lot of it is just about keeping, keeping up and being excited about, about what's possible. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned Behance, so um, I thought we could jump to that question. So. Um, Sometimes like you see designers just uh, managing like different um, portfolios. They have like the community-based ones like you know Behance, Dribble, and then they have their own personal site. Uh, yeah, where um, what are you expecting uh, designers to do with uh, with portfolio? Um, well, I I think um, I think it would be I don't want to say it's a mistake, but I don't think you should put all your eggs in one basket. I don't know if that's an expression in America, but um, I get caught on this a lot. <laughs> um, just having a website and expecting people to go there and find you on that is kind of naive. You know, you need, you, it's like a shop, you know, the bigger your shop window, the fancier the things are in the shop window, the more people will come into your store. Mm -hmm. um, and our portfolios are not so um, indifferent to that. Um, so, I mean, I, I use Dribble as well. I use Behance, obviously. Um, I have my own, because I, I build as well, so I have my, I've built my own website, which is, in part a showcase of what I can do on the design and code side of it. Um, and Behance is great for growing an audience. People discover your work, people follow your work. Recruiters are on there all the time. Some of the biggest recruiters in the world frequent Behance all the time. I mean, I, I'm literally in this country because of Behance. Adobe found me and sent me a message on Behance's internal messaging system. <laughs> so I guess I'm actually proof that it works. <laughs> you responded. Um, I realize. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah, yeah. Do you find that people keep like a certain type of works off uh, Behance yeah. and others like on their own site? Yeah, they, it can be get, it, you tend to see, Behance and Dribble are, are kind of similar like that, I suppose. You see, like Dribble will, will have a lot of kind of concept work, you know, kind of pie in the sky, look at this amazing drop down. It probably will never live on a website anywhere, potentially, but in, it, in its own isolation, it's a, it's a beautiful piece of interaction yeah. design, but it's not particularly realistic it, um, for, uh, you know, given all the constraints of, you know, real life projects. Um, Behance can kind of be the same. We see a lot of, this is a redesign of Nike.com. This is a redesign of, um, you know, a supermarket website or an e-commerce site. They're, they're very idealistic um, and they don't, you know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of hard like that. Um, I keep sidetracking, but <laughs> no, no. I think you, I think you, you hit on something which is really that um, the different different sites end up sort of catering to different audiences, and then we tailor the content to, to fit the audience. Um, yeah. You know, uh, I mean, I have a I, I love things like Tumblr or other kind of informal sites where it's more about more process based. Um, but you know, I, do I show my final work there? I don't. I don't know. You know, I and I don't know if it, that's the that's the the place. And like Dribble, Dribble in its you know concept is about you know rebounding and really developing and yep. developing ideas that real or not. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, Behance is, is, is all, it still fits into that more kind of curated um, you know professional setting. And I think it's done a great job doing yeah. that. And I think that's that's where the taking portfolio uh, as well is kind of the inspiration behind that too. Sure, yeah. I think a lot of the things, you, uh, I think a lot of the products, uh, projects on things like Behance and Dribble and inspiration sites like that, they tend to be very visual. So um, none of my projects um, have show any wireframes. I mean, a, a, probably the large part of my portfolio is UX based things. I've done a ton of wireframes that Really, it's not all about likes, but if I post those things on, on Behance and, and Dribble, I don't really think I'd get many likes. Like I say, it's not the point, yeah. but yeah. people aren't really interested to see that. But on my website, on my own website, on, on, por on portfolio, um, you know, it's your own shop window. You can do what you like with it, so things can live much, much more comfortably on those yeah. sort of platforms. Yeah. 
Um, so this talk is called Designing for Designers, and uh, both of your products are uh, basically for designers. Um, do you think that you know, it's, uh, uh, it's an advantage that you guys are designers and you're in a design team, or um, do you think it's more like dangerous because then you, know, like, you, have exp you think that you know? Yeah. It can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, I put Project Comet in front of my six-year-old the other day, <laughs> uh, who's very well versed in all things touchscreen, as all six-year-olds now are. And uh, it was quite eye-opening to actually to try and ramp him up into, into Comet. And, and I, I think it does, I mean, that's a very extreme case, but I think it does point at the danger. Um, you know, the, the danger of, uh, you know, to being almost too deep in the knowledge of products, of design tooling. Um, again, where, where I, I like to see the latest, and, and I find it easy to transition from one to another. And that's seductive, you know, the, to make that assumption that that's how everybody works. Um, and so, you know, Andrew mentioned it in his talk is that, you know, testing, user testing and getting it in front of, you know, people who are not you or people who are not us at Adobe um, is, is, is important. Uh, I mean, remember when we, when we first released the private alpha to the, you know, two dozen people out there who, I wonder if one of them made it tonight. Yeah, she did. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I, it was, I, you know, like talking to them for the first time, like they, a lot of them, and I think the honest to say, they didn't quite know what, where to go first. Mm -hmm. And again, I had been working on it for a year. So it, is, it can be very seductive and very dangerous, I think. And so it's, uh, it's up to us, I think, to, to constantly be, be putting it in front of other, other people, mm -hmm. getting their, their responses and, and, you know, making it better and finding out where we're wrong, you know. So. I don't really have a lot to add to it. I think you've really nailed it. Um, I mean, I think the difference with portfolio, I mean, um, we're not just designing for designers, it's all creative fields. So you would like to think that a product like this is very technical and maybe a web designer will look at it in a completely different light and maybe get that you click this and the line height and all that's how that works. But if you put, and I, I'm always doing this with the developers on the team actually, they'll, they'll always look at it more in, in that sense of, well, it works, you know, like people will get it. but. I always like to put them to them that actually, well, no, I mean, there's going to be fine artists using this. There's going to be people who have got, who are using their daughter's computer to update their portfolio site. They just want to click, 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 get online. They're not going to explore the product like everyone does. So yeah, it's very important to consider that whole array of users, especially when different creative fields are involved yeah. like they are with Behance and Portfolio. Yeah, yeah. So when we're designing for ourselves or our friends and we're doing things like, again, like, using them for the content or like and not accounting for what's really how people really use our you know, products and, and services or how we ourselves do it and, and I think yeah we miss opportunities mm -hmm. right, so gotcha. yeah. uh, let's talk about user testing a bit um, and I know you tested it with your daughter <laughs> my, yeah. yeah my son uh, oh that's right um, so that's right. I, you know. Uh, what, at what stage are both of your products? I know uh, it's available in 20, early 2016 for both of you. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Uh, we're going to have a, um, a public beta preview mm -hmm. uh, coming in the new year. Um, our goal to get there is really about um, making sure that if, like this is, we want this tool to be a part of your daily work. Mm -hmm. And if it's, if it's not there yet, then you know, we, everybody's time is valuable. Again, like I could go on about speed and about you know, the time and being craftspeople and how important that is for us just to get paid. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so we're looking at uh, kind of early 2016. We're getting there, we're getting close, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. yeah. We're uh, a little closer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't want to commit to date because they might kill me, but <laughs> um, yeah, we're actually in, in beta right now. We have been for um, a few weeks or more. We, we had like what we call an alpha, I suppose. So it's been out there with certain people for some time. Um, we actually do have people using it right now. If, I don't know if anyone's seen myportfolio.com, but right now there's a request early access button on there. So we've had a really great response from that, and we're basically letting in X amount of people like every day, every every couple of days. I'm not quite sure how they're doing it, but I'm sure if you guys want to do that and let me know, I might be able to <laughs> open the door <laughs> a little sooner. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I know that uh, you guys announced this product at uh, Max. Uh, when was it? July? Uh, yeah. Uh, no, it was uh, October. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and previously, like it was 
pretty much like hush hush, right? And how do you uh, balance between you know like getting user testing and getting uh, uh, user feedback early on, and also like business needs, like keeping it quiet until the right moment? To well, you know, it's uh, actually funny that um, it just so happens that the the alpha, the private alpha, went out uh, really two weeks before Max. Um, so you know, we were uh, so we we've been working on it for for uh, you know number number of months now, and it was nice to sort of get this. This sort of coinciding of, a, of events, but um, you know, it's it's hard. It was hard to to, to stay to stay quiet, particularly um, again, like there are new tools popping up all the time, and um, you know, there are uh, you know, like the the needs that we have are changing, and how do we keep up? I think with the speed of that has been a challenge, and I think uh, we sort of balance that with with you know, again, like we're solving a set of problems, and I think we have pretty strong opinions about what we're solving, and I think that that's. That's helped us keep it, I think, focused. Mm -hmm. As that, you know, we we knew again, like I think, like there's a measuring stick that we have, and we know that it, that, it, that it's ready, ready to put in front of users, and and, and ready to um, to uh, test with a wider audience. I think some of that comes from experience. I think that I've been on different projects where maybe we tested too soon, or maybe we didn't test enough, and we ended up in a place that we never intended. Um, and I said, like, timing. It becomes a lot of that, and experience I think can, can help you uh, can help you in, in knowing the time, you know, to do, to do those kind of things. So, do you guys have a spe uh, specific like user research team that? We do, yeah. Actually, XD uh, employs about a dozen researchers ourselves, and they work on all of the major products. Um, and yeah, we have we have teams who are dedicated to, to that. I think it's can always do with more. I think it's 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 always in all our fields a uh, kind of a criminally underrepresented. Uh, uh, role mm -hmm. um, because of its importance. And again, I think a lot of the testing comes from us using the products ourselves. And again, that's, that's seductive and that can be a trap. And so uh, it's always helpful when you have someone who's dedicated to, to listening. That's kind of the key thing with, with user testing. And, and not, all, you know, not all researchers can do that and do that well. And if you have one of those, then you hang on to them and fight for them uh, every chance you get. So. Um, you mentioned, you know, um, designing for like different types of creatives. So, are you also incorporating the different audience groups into testing? Um, we don't have as much. That's harder, I guess. We don't have as much visibility as to who is actually requesting early access right now. We've certainly gone out to certain Behance members that we're maybe more engaged with. I mean, we have we have a crazy following. Um, there are there are like fanatical people surrounding Behance. So, um, I mean, we we can. I don't want to say use that, it's not the right term, but um, yeah, there are people who really want to see this product come alive. You know, there are, there are existing users of, of ProSite, the old product, who desperately want to see a responsive end product. And these, these people have, you know, it's been, it's been good to work with people like that and, uh, and get their opinions. Yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, Talon, you mentioned using Envision uh, during your process. And I know right now it's like there's an explosion of uh, prototyping tools and also like sharing of the prototypes. Uh, does uh, what Comma does kind of uh, inter intersect with what Envision does a little bit, or like you know, you guys are like completely separate? Yeah, I think there will. I think there will naturally be some overlap. Um, again, I think that Envision does an amazing job at the creating interactive prototypes and sharing. Um, and so we definitely want to find ways that we can uh, work with Envision, I think, is, is kind of one of the goals that we have. Uh, again, as well as, again, I think the needs are just going to continue to change. You know, when, when we launch Comet, I think we'll be in a different place than we are right now. And so, again, we're both sort of thinking about how we can partner uh, with the tools that are out there right now, as well as think about what's coming in the future and really setting up uh, users with, with Comet and with things like Creative Cloud Libraries. Um, services like Behance, and how again we have an opportunity, I think, to to uh, to put some of those pieces together to uh, for for a product when we when we launch kind of one out. So, gotcha. yeah, um, uh, let's talk about um, uh, platforms a little bit. So you showed your like dream dream ideal state with like mobile. Um, do you do you see Comet going on like multiple uh, platforms, and you know what's going to be different uh, across them? Yeah, so we uh, we did something that I think was uh, uh, a little a little crazy is that we we decided to, to focus on on a platform at least initially, mainly for speed, um, and not only speed in development but also speed of the product. We wanted to optimize for platforms, and we wanted to you know we we built some some new technology from scratch to be the fastest most performant app on the Mac um, and on iOS as well. And that, that was a decision that we made. And I think that 
uh, again, when, when you make a choice, uh, there will be some other choices that you leave on the table. Uh, but we are looking to do the same for Windows platform uh, as well as Android. And I think that's really just about timing and about the, again, the resources. Uh, you know, we have a great, I mean, I'm working with some of the smartest people I think I've ever met in my life. And only they can do so much. So, um, again, you know, just, just choices and trade offs, you know, that you make, uh, I think, you know, uh, to support both, again, our design goals, our business goals, and our goals for technology. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. How about portfolio? I guess um, portfolio is is much more simple. I suppose it's it's it is a web based product. There's I mean there's certainly been talk of you know apps in in the future to edit your portfolio, but for now it is web based. So I mean I, we definitely focus on things like Chrome because it's probably what ninety nine percent of the people in the office use. Right. But you know obviously we look at, we look at all the browsers. We make sure it works across across platforms in that way. But maybe it's a uh, a little bit more straightforward with web-based. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that uh, that little prototype that I showed with the with the an the animated sort of side panels, yeah. uh, that was that was definitely one of the things that influenced kind of like uh, going native. I think you know we want to be able to do new things, uh, which is sometimes again a little bit a little bit crazy, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's fun to get that opportunity. Yeah, uh, when people talk about going native, sometimes I, I hear people like discuss. Uh, tailoring your like UI uh, to fit you know like the operating system that you're working with um, does that uh, come to your thoughts at all yeah definitely I think that um, again again it really comes down to like time and resources mm -hmm. and where you choose to focus I think that when you go native what you can do is you can take advantage of what's there and I think that's what you know Apple has done in their in their world to make it easy for developers to take advantage of the capabilities mm -hmm. And uh, you you see it you see you see the popularity you see the amount of apps made and you can't deny that and I think that uh, you know it's going to be more and more important as more people uh, you know have the tools available to to develop ideas uh, they will look at the platforms and and make choices and again it's always about trade off and I think that um, but what's fascinating is to see how the whole industry is moving forward and how we're seeing more uh, and people are doing more with. With, with Android and the, with the material design language uh, and with Windows 10. And um, you know, those are a little bit, little bit newer, a little bit younger, um, but they're all going to come along and I think uh, are going to take us someplace really amazing. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so besides the Adobe products, uh, who else do you think is getting right, uh, getting the product design right? <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we all like to hate them, but I can't. <laughs> I just can't, I can't deny uh, the work that they do with their team. And uh, similarly, I think, you know, uh, you know, Google and uh, material design and the work that they're doing on their sort of connected services. Again, I, I, I really attracted anything that helps me do things faster. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, and elegantly, and of course, you know, if it does it very, you know, very beautifully, then even better. And I think that you know, I, I, I'm constantly inspired by what those two groups are doing right now. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I guess I'm gonna have to be boring and say I pretty much have exactly the same answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, I, I've really liked, um, maybe not on the product level, but I've loved, I've, I've, like I say, I look at Behance a lot and I've discovered agencies like Elegant uh, Seagulls, I think it is, and Basic Agency in San Diego. There's, there's a lot of really great agencies that I've been looking to get inspired because like I say, I'm, a lot of my work is, I guess that's a big difference between us, like more on the software side and on the website. Potentially, I, I probably look more to web design and uh, for inspiration. So yeah, agents like that are good. I think Hello, I think they're based in New York. They do some really awesome stuff. Um, many more that I wish I could name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, everyone. <laughs> uh, talking about other companies, um, I used to work at a startup, and you know, I, uh, it was a mobile messaging startup, and we would uh, look at other competitors to see what they were doing, and I noticed that you know, like, there's that tension between. Uh, like looking, like copying what they're doing, uh, and like trying to, because like that kind of keeps you from being innovative. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. um, I, can, I can start. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's easy. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I th I think that uh, you know innovation for innovation's sake uh, is is kind of sometimes a path to nowhere. I think uh, what what I try and do is is look at patterns and look at like I said, like how people naturally interact with software. And I, I look at those patterns, I'm inspired by those patterns, and um, you know, I don't try and reinvent the wheel all the time. Um, again, I've actually been thinking a lot lately about Illustrator and Photoshop and about their paneling system. And I think for the, for the, for the fresh user, 
that's a really complex set of problems to put in your face. Not only do you have to figure out how to draw on the, or create something on this space, but you have to figure out how to organize your space. But there are so many great ideas there that I hate to just sort of dismiss it out of hand. Like, oh, I'm gonna do something new. I'm not gonna do panels and things like Illustrator and Photoshop do. And I, I said I would do myself a disservice and the product a disservice and everyone else a disservice from, from doing that because there are, are ways in which we work and there are things that, that do work and resonate really well with people so I try to take advantage of those where I can and, and again not try and reinvent the wheel. Uh, but then maybe try and just do something a little little new every once in a while. So like the repeat grid for example. That was one of the examples. So. I totally lost track of the original question. <laughs> <laughs> I was too busy yeah. listening to that. <laughs> well, it was one of the tension between like copying what other people uh, do and um, trying to be innovative. Yeah, yeah um, I guess that's a tricky question uh, with product design, I suppose. Um, you want, we always want to do something different. We always want to create the next best thing. But at the same time, you know, user behaviors, people are used to using things in a certain way, they're used to the things looking a certain way. You click on a drop, you click on a select, you expect a drop down to come down. So things like that, um, especially for a product like Portfolio, where so much of it is form based, there's so many inputs, there's so many change the size, change this, select in this, opt out of that. You can't go too far away from what the users would consider normal um, because they won't understand the product, and that, and if they don't understand it, You've, you've done a very bad job. <laughs> um, you know, what I love about web design, I think the, the design as we've grown with the web is that um, you're always building on something. I, think, I, I mean, that's how I learned to code, was I, you know, I, I built on somebody else's piece of code. Mm -hmm. And I just love the, the sort of, again, I think I like the ethos of that. And I, like, and I think you know, someone like Bob Dylan speaks similarly about music, um, where you work within forms, and then you find the way to put your voice to it. And I think that, you know, as creatives, we're always trying to do that. And I think when we try to say, and I think I did a lot in school, which is I'm gonna like, I've gotta do it original. I've gotta do it all on my own. It's all on me. Yeah. You've, you've rested too much on you and you kind of, you crumple kind of, and you get crushed under the weight of that expectation for yourself. And uh, you know, like I said, like, take advantage of what's there. And there's a lot of built-in knowledge. There's a lot of knowledge that we have culturally uh, uh, and we, designers should take advantage of it. I think the good ones do. Yeah, and I think sometimes it's, it's very easy to over-design these things. Um, for, for these products, a lot of the time, uh, there's, there's, this might sound corny, but there's three words, I said them in the, in the talk actually, but there's three words that I always come back to. It's simple, bold, and beautiful. I know that's incredibly corny, but <laughs> it is something I have, I mean, I've written it down in the sketches. It probably was on the, in the slides there. Um, but yeah, it, you know, don't overdesign it, don't overthink it. You know, just just those clean lines, just just you know, strip it back, design everything, and then just keep pulling stuff out and like just keep taking stuff away and see what you're left with. So. Yeah. Uh, so one last question, and we'll open up. Um, and this comes from Liz, so I apologize for putting you on a spot. Um, so you guys are designers, and you guys have seen each other's tools. Uh, imagine we are in a design crit. If you were to do a design crit of each other's tools, uh, <laughs> what is one comment you would give one another to? Um, uh, improve on the UX, uh, user experience of each of the products. Wow. <laughs> I don't even know where yeah. to start. I mean, I... Uh, when, it's nice, could be a problem. When it's <laughs> not, uh, I mean, you know, there's so much respect, I think, for any designer that puts the amount of work and care into products like, like Andrew did and showcase in the, in the thing tonight. It's, it's, it's a little hard to, to come at. I, if I had a wish for, for any editor online, it was, and this is, you know, just, be more direct, you know? Like, you know, try and get, get a, you know, I think Andrew's doing that, just trying to get out of the way, getting that UI out of the way of, uh, of uh, the user and, or the creative and, and their work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the challenge they have, and I think they're doing a beautiful job doing it. So I don't know if <laughs> criticize that much, really, so. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm sure, like all you guys, I was actually blown away by that. I've seen various videos, and, um, but there was a lot of things in there, especially the image dropping thing that actually blew me away. <laughs> Every time I do it, man. <laughs> it <blows me. laughs> I kind of hate your designer now for the interactive style guide as well, because uh, the developers where I work think I'm insane, so if, I saw, if they see that, they, I don't know what they do. He sets the bar high, man. I, I try and keep up, and I just can't. Yeah, I think so. I've met my match. Yeah. <laughs> you should, you guys, I'll hook you up with him. Yeah, you can teach yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I don't. I don't really have. There's, there's definitely nothing critical. Well, we got to get it in your hands first, and then you can really tell me what you think. Yeah, I like. So. I like to see and use it. Yeah, hope for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I would like to see the the connectivity. I think you know, like you say, actually. Yeah. Um, I think I think it does it. You know, it's not really a, cri a critique, but I'd love to see that connectivity of um, doing things on screen and then working with it on my iPad yeah. and iPhone. So that's. That's really exciting. I'd love to see that. And we have a and long I know way to go on, on, the, on, the, on the data <laughs> stuff too, because that's I, you know, you're I have you in mind when I'm doing something like yeah. that. So I definitely would appreciate any feedback on that when we get to you. So for sure, yeah, I will definitely use it though. I mean, like I say, <laughs> everything you just saw, especially with the prototyping side of it, would really have been invaluable for me the last year. Like really, seriously. User <laughs> feedback. <laughs> Where were you? <laughs> All right. Well, on that very, very nice note, uh, let's open up for questions. So I have a mic here, and um, I know it gets a bit tough passing it around in a large room, but I'm going to try. Um, so this is not for amplification. It's just for like recording purposes. So um, raise your hand, and I'll like, try to get scramble the mic to you and grab it back from you after. Yes. So I actually have two questions. One is for Talon, and I wonder when UX design is increasingly becoming less the provenance of a designer and more the provenance of sort of a consultant, like figuring out the way of the company, so somebody with less design skills, how are you factoring that in? And then for Andrew, what happened to Adobe Muse? Adobe Muse? <laughs> I, uh, uh, I thought you said news. <laughs> I was like, there isn't a news. <laughs> I don't trust consultants, but that's my own bias. Um, mainly because they're, they come in, and I, I think to truly make a great product, you have to have knowledge. It's not drive-by knowledge. Um, you've got to know the, the people that, you're, that you want to use the, your products. You have to know the problems that, that they're facing. And I don't believe that, like I said, unless the consultants are very highly paid, and have a ton of uh, sort of, if, if you're hiring them for their knowledge of a particular you know, group of people. No, I, I yeah. think that they're, meaning that they're figuring out they've got a business sense but not a design sense. Oh, oh, sort of, well, I also, I have a, you know, like I think that, um, that business, uh, you know, that, that again, I think designers are, are increasingly being asked the question and why they're playing a more central role is because they are have, they are having to think about business and technology and I think that what they what good designers also have to do is partner well with people who have again knowledge I think that's the thing is that the, the whatever whatever you know wherever you're coming from uh, to build great products you, you you have to have knowledge or you have to be willing to listen and to go out and 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 listen to people and test and learn um, and uh, I think you know we all know the products that do that and do that well. And I think we, we know when, when it's gone off. I don't know if that gets to kind of what, what you're thinking about, but I think there's a role to play, uh, uh, you know, again, and, and myself on Project Comet, um, you know, I partner with business uh, and technology. So, you know, I'm kind of the, basically like the third leg to that stool. Um, but we all have to be checking one another and we all have to, to, to kind of know you know, kind of know what's what uh, with the different groups going on. Like, I, Repeat Grid came from a tight collaboration between myself and and uh, and a uh, and a, you know two really amazing engineers, and that's how the thing it couldn't have gone any other way if I wasn't listening and they weren't listening and we weren't having a conversation. And it's the same with business. I think again, I just I uh, I like to make sure that people uh, you know again approach it in the right way and and are and are willing to learn and to listen. You know, so. Um, Adobe Muse, uh, it's alive and kicking as far as I'm aware. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I think the I think they even uh, did a, a new version recently. They did. Wrong. They showed off some really great features on stage at Adobe Max uh, yep. for responsive design. Um, I think that it's it, it's an amazingly solid product, and I think that uh, I think it can be overlooked because of that because it it. it yeah, yeah, it moves along, and it and yeah. I know the the product manager, and she's. Um, just phenomenal, um, and that team is doing doing great work. And I think that what we're trying to do at Adobe as well is to have to have more ideas cross those boundaries between products. So great ideas coming from Muse uh, can be shared and can be socialized and end up you know with all the products can take advantage of those great ideas. And I think vice versa. You know, and I think yeah. that's just our challenge at Adobe. You know, so. yeah. And actually, the the type kit stuff I showed—I mean, it was very brief on there—but the type kit stuff was actually born from Muse. From Muse. Mm -hmm. I love that. 
yeah, yeah. They, they were working, uh, the team at Muse were working with the team at Typekit. I've worked a lot with Typekit on that one. And um, yeah, they, they showed me sort of a pre-release of the, the new things coming up for Muse. Uh, the big part of that was Typekit. So I really took what was on Muse and what was on Typekit and made it work for portfolio and more of a web based. But I, you know, I, I can't see it I going anywhere. Yeah, I mean, some people, some people prefer to use software. You know, some people like to use the web. So it's good to have options for all those. I think you'll see great things coming in Muse in the next year as well. So. Yeah. Hi, um, what are the different methods in uh, the ways that you learn from your users, whether it's going to be in beta or um, when it's released to millions of people, how, what's the tangible way in which you, or in the different channels in which you learn from, uh, for usability purposes, as well as just understanding on a larger scale the appeal of the product? So how do we collate user testing so yeah when it's live completely and and what are the different ways in which you know what to change for behance i guess that's much easier um because we because it's more kind of baked in i suppose because it is a it is a community it's a community platform so with that comes messaging you know you it's very easy to get in touch with the, the community team there and they're they're a great i mean i would say that but they are a great group of people that are, they're super friendly and i think they're very very good at what they do and um, you know they'll, they talk to the users, the users talk to them, and uh, they come to us, and they'll come directly to the designers. They'll go directly to the developers to say this person had this problem, this person couldn't figure this out, and then you know, I mean, some, some, a lot of the time, some of the things the, that you hear are kind of hilarious, you know, as you'd expect, and sometimes it's a serious thing. It's things you didn't think about. So, you know, if one or two, three people start talking about something, it's time to seriously debate that and then we'll, you know, get together as designers and developers and, and discuss those things and make do something about it. Uh, you know, one thing we've been trying in NXT is kind of taking um, a sort of like, um, I don't know, you can think about it almost as a like sort of ground up sort of approach where we have um, researchers who are actually ethnographers, who actually embed you know, with studios, uh, actually work very closely with designers in forming a relationship. Again, looking for problems, you know, looking for things that, that they, and how they work. So we do that, it's very personal one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and then we do kind of much more sort of direct user testing. Again, this is all about how we kind of scale up, um, where, you know, usually they're testing a uh, prototype or the real product, and it's really, you know, focused on a small set so we can have them really engage with us and give us direct feedback. Again, these are the users that I think are willing to put in a little more time. And so, and then we have kind of wider testing that happens when we instrument products, and I think Behance has a real great advantage because they are a web product and that instrumentation is all built in from the ground up. Um, again, for Comet being new, we're actually building a lot of that right now ourselves so that when we come to uh, a point where we can release wider, Again, we're gonna, it's, we changes the type of feedback we'll get because we just can't scale up to support that. And so it'll change because how we then call, you know, sort of bring that data from the app itself and then how we uh, you know, interpret it. And I think it, um, you know, some of it, I think Andrew hinted at this, some of it is um, you know, like, well, this is something new. So we, we, we know what we're, we're, we're looking for a response and we know where to place it. As we're, some of it is, is really just about like hard data. They're just not doing this, and we wanted, we thought they would, and they didn't. And then we have to really f look at why. And one of the things that we're trying to do to make sure we know how these placed is that we um, we put them in what we call a um, oh um, well, it's a funnel basically, similar to like what I said, where where we feel like this is what success is, and then these are the steps that we imagine that someone would take to get there and be successful. And then we we put in basically those flags at kind of every moment. So that we know, and again, we have a really strong opinion because sometimes you can instrument everything, and then you have to sort through all that later. And we're trying to do a lot of that work up front. So I don't know. If that's a little, that's a little deep, but hopefully that's you know good information. Yeah. So that's kind of a good point, though. I, I think you do learn a lot from how people use the product, like we said. But you can do it. You can automate a lot of that. You know, are people clicking? How many people are clicking this? No one's ever clicked that. That's probably bad because that's quite a key feature. You know, um, we can do this through analytics, and there's all sorts of metrics we can set up. And you learn, you know, it's not just user testing. You learn a lot from just, you know, pure statistics, yourself, yeah. which is you've got to analyze them. Yeah. Uh, 
<clears throat> both these products are going into markets where there are, are established winners. How do you guys, while you're designing, how do you guys think about the competition? And I'll just name them, like, for portfolio, maybe Squarespace and for um, <clears throat> for Comet, um, Sketch, and Envision. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you wouldn't believe how many times I've someone said the word Squarespace to me <laughs> over the past um, couple of months. Um, you know, I don't really, I don't, it's hard to know how to term this. I don't, I don't really see them as competing products. I mean, obviously, in, in many ways they are, but I do feel like uh, Squarespace is, is a great product. It's a beautiful product, um, but it, it's, it's a much broader product. You know, you have everyone from, I mean, I've, I, I get wedding invitations from Squarespace. I get, obviously, there's a lot of designer portfolios on there. Uh, you get, um, you know, there's uh, restaurants and cafes with their food menus up there with a simple book at your table now. Um, so they have a really broad range of, of clients and their editor has to account for all those scenarios. I think uh, one place where portfolio is very different is that we, we I mean, it does what it says on the tin. I mean, it's why we called it portfolio. You know, it, it is a portfolio builder. Um, so we can really we can really focus the product in on that. It does exactly what you need it to do, and, and not well, not nothing else. But you know, it's a very it's a, the developers will kill me. <laughs> it's a very clever product. Um, but yeah, I, I'd, I'd say you know there are all these other products on the market, but I'd say I'd argue that portfolio kind of you know really really focuses in on on creatives, on artists, on photographers, on graphic designers. You know to to just get online. You know, quick, quick, fast, build a beautiful portfolio, sync it to your hands. Yeah. And uh, of course, you had to bring up <laughs> the two. But, um, you know, I'm really inspired by them. I don't, again, I, I, I love both of those products. And I think that we're all kind of standing on the shoulders of giants when it comes to, you know, things like Photoshop and Illustrator and the like. And I think that we have a lot of shared knowledge that we, that we build on. And I think that um, those two products in particular, I think they, they solve problems. And I think they resonated with designers because they they solved the problem and said this is this is for you. They 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 targeted a group of people and they said this is this is this is your tool. This is the problems that we're solving for you. And I'm constantly inspired by that. And again, I think that also I wouldn't be building Comet if it hadn't been for those two as well. So again, I I think I owe a lot to those. And I think the way I work with them now is really. Again, like it's kind of a conversation, you know. When I see and I and I see new tools crop up, um, you know, uh, designers were naturally competitive. But I think that, again, like I uh, have chosen sort of focus, um, kind of, and, and have an opinion about what I want to do, and then I uh, stay open to being inspired and informed by uh, those other great products. I mean, I think again, like I, I think one I failed to mention earlier with the question about who who do I admire in the product space. Envision, you know, is right there at the top as well. I think they're just not they're just killing it right now. And I think that, um, you know, I try not to get to again like everybody's developing and putting out new features. And you know, I just I think I have kind of the belief in in the problem that that we're trying to solve. And I think of the way in which we're doing it. And I think uh, again, but always staying open to, to being inspired by and, and again I think looking for ways to collaborate as well I think you know that's you know, one of the things that um, at Adobe is that uh, you know and people that I know I know I use a lot of things to solve my problems in my daily work and and uh, you know we want to find ways I think to collaborate and uh, to support each other so um, you touched upon it a little bit about your design research team I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the ideal relationship looks like working together and when there's been maybe a situation that could have been communicated better between the two of you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, uh, I, I said, like, I, I, uh, the, there's a, I have a couple of favorite researchers and it's mainly because I think they, they listen and they're, they're curious and they're, they're interested in, in problems. And I think when, I, when maybe some research work hasn't resonated with me is when it's strictly usability. You know, it's strictly the numbers. You know, it's strictly, there's no, the, I, context re is really important. And so, you know, you need a researcher who is embedded with and, 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 and it's interested in solving the same problems. And um, we said when it's disconnected, I said whether it's uh, consultants or uh, researchers or business, um, when you're not looking at the problem holistically and you're not willing to learn and to listen, I think that's, that's when it never quite works out. Um, 
Yeah, we don't know no no conflicts. I mean, we don't have as big a like I say, you know, with the hands, I guess it's a bit more sort of baked in, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I mean, I I literally sit within reach of our community team. <laughs> you know, uh, um, they 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 sit next to me. So um, you know, we really just we just chat, and it, it's a great it's a great working relationship. And I think just generally, um, you just got to be open to what they tell you. Sometimes you won't always agree with them. You know, you, there's a lot of times where you fall out. There are with all of us. You know, so I'm sure there are many times the developers have wanted to kill me. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, talking to the user researchers, people testing the product, even even in, um, talking to developers and other designers. You know, yeah. there's there's no real source of bad information with these things. Everyone is a user in their own way. So you just got to be open to their feedback and you know, and deal with it. And, and one thing you hint at that I don't know that we neither of us could could. Uh, could could overstate is uh, these are team efforts. The yeah. scale at which w that that we work um, is sometimes very staggering, and you know we couldn't do it if you know we weren't again working with I think some of the smartest people going and uh, you know like to uh, feel very lucky I think to be working with the team that I'm working with both yeah. research engineering business. Um, it's it's really exciting time right now uh, at Adobe. I'm yeah. a little biased. We've got but, some yeah. very yeah. very smart developers. Yeah, both of yeah. Us. yeah. so. <laughs> Uh, I've got uh, two questions. I guess I'll start with the first. Um, how would you describe uh, working and exploring uh, with technology, with things like uh, the repeat grid and stuff like that? And uh, the second question is, um, how do you guys at, at Adobe kind of manage features from a sort of service ecosystem perspective? Just because you know, there's like this proliferation of tools, like from capture to draw to sketch to you know. Um, to get that consistency across different platforms and across different tool sets. <laughs> you want to take the platform one first? Um, yeah, the set, the second one. Yeah, um, yeah that that's a that's a funny one. It, it's kind of hard with with a, a company as, as large as Adobe. Obviously, there are brand guidelines. You know that I've mostly thrown out the window. <laughs> but <laughs> I know some people would be very because I'm a bit of a. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. The. Uh, obviously, you respect all these things. You, you have to have a good understanding of them. But you, I think, you also need to know when, um, when to sort of step outside of the box on that one. Um, portfolio, I guess, is a little bit different. I think, I think, in many ways, we are getting away with murder on some things. Um, but the essence of the product is, it's a customizable product. It's something. It's, some, it's a tool we give you to create something and make it your own. So that's actually informed the brand a lot. Um, I mean, looking at the, at the when you look at the home page, you know, the, the, the bright pink, the, uh, the Adele Ball font, the, the beautiful uh, typekit fonts, the serif font, which is so far removed from the Adele clean um, uh, font. Um, yeah, things like that. Um, just, just to sort of try and give, give portfolio its own voice outside of this sort of corporate. And, you know, Adobe and Behance both have very strong and very recognizable brands. So I think I feel it was quite important to give portfolio its kind of own unique flavor of uh, sort of getting people on board with that. Just customize, customize it, make it your own kind of vibe. Yeah. Um, and for the others on like repeat grid, uh, you know, they, uh, as a designer, I think you need to be interested in and aware of technology. And I think having a great relationship with engineers and developers uh, can help that, where it becomes more of a conversation. And in, in Repeat Grid, it really was that. Uh, you know, we, we, we sat around, we, we saw something. Uh, we, we, stuck, we stood back and we looked at it and we started to see where it fit and what problem was it solving and why would we even be trying this in the first place. And uh, you know, it was a fascinating sort of, uh, it was a, you know, I said, I, we, I think the way we, we, we arrived at with it, and we're, we're still not done with that, um, has really been about uh, you know, that, that collaboration. Uh, I always love um, Anarud, who's uh, one of our just amazing uh, software engineers. He's like, he's like, how do you, he's always telling me like, how do you take what I do and make it look amazing? You know, because, and I think they just, they, they, they li like, everybody likes that. I love being wowed and being just floored by the work that they do. And they just, you know, eat up everything that the design team does, you know, both, you know, with the technology and with the tool itself. You know, we're designing Comet in Comet, and I can't tell you how amazing that is, uh, and kind of weird it is as well. 
And then for the other quickly, I think it just comes with engagement. Again, we're a really big company. Um, but XD, again, we work on all the products. You know, my colleagues are working on Microning Cloud and Acrobat and all the, the tools. And uh, a lot of that that's engaged and a lot of those those services that sort of connect them, uh, you know, we have to choose to do it. You know, if we don't do it, if we don't, if we're not all excited about libraries and making libraries work and be available with you everywhere in any of our apps, it's not going to happen. And so a lot of it, again, it just comes from, I think, wanting to make that happen. And being aligned on that vision, you know, goes a long way, so. Um, as a product designer in Adobe, um, and for prototyping, what kind of um, um, code-related skills are needed, and how, how much do you have to do that? Mm -hmm. um, I know. You're probably the skills needed for prototyping. Yeah. Uh, Coding. Yes yeah, no. that's that's a hard question. I mean, there are there are how many ways do you think there are to prototype? Oh, I was at a, a Google Span conference actually. Oh, yeah. Um, a week or two ago, right? Yeah, a yeah. couple of weeks ago, and it, it was amazing. Um, you know, you, you realize you you really know nothing sometimes. You know, people. <laughs> there was a panel of people talking about things I you know products I'd never heard of and. Um, there are so many different ways, and I don't think there's any right or wrong way of, of doing that, honestly. Um, I think you, you use what works for you. Um, like I said earlier about freelance, you'll step into places and people will expect that you will, can work, use that. Uh, but sometimes there has to be some give on that. They, um, you'll, you'll step into some places where they'll want you to learn it. By the end of the day, we want you to be fluent in this new piece of software, which was me with OmniGraph with the startup I used to work at which was a, not a pleasant day. Um, but um, yeah, everyone's different. I mean, I, I build, I code as well, just front end stuff, CSS, some JavaScript. Um, so for me, I, I actually quite like getting, getting dirty with the code <laughs> um, and just sort of um, iterating like that. And I use layer comps in Photoshop extensively because I'm kind of crazy and old school like that. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, you use you use what's what's best for you. But some people will expect that you'll know everything. You read any job description, they ex they expect Superman to step through the door, yeah. uh, and that's just not real anymore. There's just too many tools out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think the range of capabilities when it comes to coding kind of spans the gamut. I think it's again about what your goals are as a designer and what you want to do and what the problem is you're trying to solve. And so I said, um, uh, prototypes can be made with paper, could be a simple walkthrough, could be a few sketches, could be you know, an Envision prototype, could be something even simpler, like you know, Keynote, uh, we use a lot. And I, I think, uh, again, it's, it's all about kind of you know, fitting the tool to the job that you're trying to do. And I think a lot of that is about, you know, like I can get away sometimes with sound effects and hand gestures because I have, you know, again, I built a relationship with, with really smart people. Um, and sometimes, you know, we we need more. And again, like, I can keep those just range, you know. So. One last question. Um, I have a question about product management. Uh, so you've worked with hopefully some particularly good product managers in your experiences, and I was curious if you've ever found that they have any sort of common characteristics or capabilities that made them particularly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. We have great product managers. No, no, no. Yeah, no, no, no. no. I, uh, I think, again, I, it's very similar to what I said earlier about, I think, um, any role is that, um, first off, I, I want to know what you're going to bring to the table. You know, like, and, and it needs to be unique and it needs to, I think, have a voice to it. And then the, the good ones know that very well and do that well. And, and again, relationship building is probably the heart of everything that we do as designers. I think you know, none of us can really go it alone, or maybe very few of us can. Um, again, at the scale that we're working at, we, we can't. And uh, you know, I, I need that partner in business, uh, you know, product you know, management and development. Um, you know, and those roles change. Not everybody does it the same way. Um, but again, I think you know, um, design has become more and more important. And I think that you know, I think we're still, you know, the, the roles are still shifting, but again, it's all really about the relationship and, and about what you bring to it. Um, What's your perspective on the product manager role in general, maybe, if you have like a one or two line on Or if it's more than that? <laughs> it depends. I, I think it's about, about like, uh, you know, how, how you're trying to solve a problem. I think that it's, 
um, important because again, like the, the scale you're trying to work with when, when it comes to product design is massive and you know, like uh, any, any you know, time that I have that I spend you know, talking uh, you know, about the business and thinking about the business and, and doing the research and putting together the numbers, at, you know, it's time that away from my job as a designer. But I need to be aware of that. You know, I need to be, I need to be well versed in it so that I can take full advantage of it, as, and vice versa. And so uh, again, this is maybe a little lot wrong. It's, let's just say they are good product managers and they're bad product managers, and you'll see the bad <laughs> style of product management go by the wayside, uh, and you will see the ascendancy of a of a of a different approach again, which which is more cost, customer focused. Um, and again, like we all have roles to play. So. But so just so I quickly understand that one bit of value that you were describing just before was that they sort of digest a lot of information and a lot of data, perhaps user consumer insights that you can then that they then surface to you in the best possible way. So it's not time away from your design. Exactly. Exactly. That's very well put. You should. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we, you, with a question like that, you will always laugh because any any designer has always worked with a good project manager and many bad project managers. You know, there are, um, any it's it's kind of a dirty word in like ad agencies. Um, designers sometimes, you know, the, the, yeah, I think but then again, people hate you designers. Mean, you too, might know, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think, um, I, uh, yeah. But I I think a, I think a good project manager is actually um, maybe they're doing a good job when you don't really hear about them. You know, um, they they quietly kind of work behind the scenes. Or they project or product manager. Product. Um, product. Yeah. Maybe we don't have as many product managers. Maybe you we, might not. Is it more related to product management? Product, yeah. Oh, yeah. right, yeah. I'm kind of going on the project management. But, uh. <laughs> Scott's, Scott's still technically your product manager. <laughs> yes, that's the one now. OK, we're answering different questions. All right, all right. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I love product managers. <laughs> I have a problem with project managers. <laughs> Why do you love product managers? Sorry? Why do you love product managers? Well, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm just saying that. <laughs> I, I don't have as much involvement with them, really. I, I mean, my, my time on this product particularly has been, I've, I've basically lived in Photoshop and come up for air to see my girlfriend and play with my cat every now and again, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'm answering a different question. Sorry. <laughs> Great. Uh, with that, thank you very much, Andrew. Very, thank you very much, Talon. And thanks uh, for having us, guys.